We're going to talk some football now. Would you give a warm welcome back to Mr. John Hartson and also with them, Mr. Jamie Delaney, everybody. John, I won't lie, it feels like we've been here for about seven hours at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> Good, that was fun. Damon Delaney, you're very welcome. Hello. How are you? You did not enjoy much of that Irish performance, I think it's fair to say, before we get into World Cup business. Uh, you know, listen, it wasn't, it's another defeat. Um, played reasonably well for maybe 20 minutes in the second half. Um, so, it's, it, you know, yeah, it was, it was, the first half definitely wasn't enjoyable, no. We won't dwell on this because we are here to talk about the World Cup. The first half you felt was an encapsulation of the issues that you've long had with Ireland under Stephen Kenny. Explain why. No, like, the first half we, we, we had an awful lot of possession on the edge of our own box, passing it amongst each other. But then we ran out of ideas and it went long. And then when it went long, we lost the second ball. The pitch was stretched and it was day the upper hand, definitely. Second half, we went long, but we, everybody knew we were going long. We, we, boxed it in and we created sustained periods of pressure and actually looked really good for 20 minutes. Then both teams started making substitutions. The rhythm of the game kind of died down a little bit, but they got the winner, you know. So, I mean, we can say that we made changes, but, but they did too. And, um, you know, it's just not a good look when you keep losing games of football. Okay. You're flying out to Qatar? Saturday morning, Saturday. four o'clock. Okay. And Wales are in the group with England, Iran, USA. So let's start with those two teams. England and, and Wales are, are of interest, I think, generally to us. So do Wales go out feeling very optimistic, team in good shape? What's the general mood? I don't think there's any pressure on Wales. I don't think they've not been to a World Cup for 64 years. Um, They'll want to be competitive. They'll, they'll want to do their utmost best against the USA and Iran. I think they're winnable games. Um, USA have some good players, you know, uh, McKenney, who's midfield player, Juventus, and Reina, who's at uh, Borussia Dortmund. Uh, Weir, who's the great George Weir's son, good player. Um, so they've got some decent players, uh, the USA, but so have Wales. So I, 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 think it's, I think England will probably win top the group because of their strength. Um, and then it's between probably, I would say, Wales and the USA, and that's just trying to be as honest as I can. Uh, but it, it, they're games that, that Wales are capable of winning. There's no doubt about that. Lots of very good players in that Welsh team. Daniel James, you know, plenty of speed, a new addition, I suppose, in, in recent years. Ramsey has been there a long time. Allen's been there a long time. And then, of course, you talk about Wales, talk about Gareth Bale. Mm. Where is Bale at this stage in his career when it comes to his body and his hunger? Though, to be fair, I don't think there's ever been any question mark over his desire in a, in a red jersey, whatever about Real Madrid fans' uh, perspective on things. So where's Bale in 2022? Well, Gareth's always turned up, really. Um, He's, he loves playing for Wales. He's a, he's a consummate sort of uh, professional. He's had injury problems uh, in the last four or five years. Only played, I think it was five games for Real Madrid. And then he came to play for Wales. And he scores two unbelievable goals against Austria. Um, and then... He's never really had to be playing regular for a club team. It's quite a unique situation, really. Aaron Ramsey has played two games for Nice, but he might go and score the winning goal for Wales. They've just been big players for their countries. And if Ramsey and Bale are in the team and they prove their fitness, then they're two players that can change a game. And and I just think it's, uh, 
is a generation thing. Wales have had, Wales have been to three major tournaments in six years. Two Euros and obviously the World Cup 2016, 2022. And they've had this golden generation. They've produced a lot of good players at the same time. And that's what's happened. That's, that's why we're able to qualify because we've, we've had these players. And at this moment in time, the Republic of Ireland, they're not producing them world-class players. You look at a generation ago when you had Keane, McAteer, Staunton, I could go on and on and on. The time before that, McGrath, Moran, Aldridge, I could go on and on and on. You, you need to produce these players because Wales might have a barren spell after the World Cup because the young players have to step up. And Gareth has been, in, he's, you know, he's got 40 goals in 103 caps. It's freakish, really. And you might have heard a bit more than we have through the grapevine. What's your sense of Bale in Madrid when he was there? Did he fall out of love with football? Was he just unhappy with the club? Like, it was very hard to understand what was going on with Bale uh, without knowing the, the, being in the inner sanctum at Madrid. Well, I, think, I think they give Gareth Bale Ronaldo's contract when Ronaldo left. Um, but this is a man that has won five Champions Leagues, scored the winner in two Champions League finals, yeah. you know, scored over 100 goals. He's the best ever foreign import that's played abroad. You could talk about Sunas, you could talk about Inns, Gascoigne. Never had the impact Baylor had. And he still gets criticised. Well, I guess there's a perception that he had those big moments in big finals, but certainly the last year or two, he was a fringe player almost, which is bizarre was, considering his talent. He was being wise. He was almost seeing his contract out. Yeah. You know, he was on 600 grand a week, reportedly, allegedly. Yeah. So he ain't going to walk away from that in a hurry. You know, good golf courses as well in Madrid, so they tell me. But you see, isn't that, that would be the thing, like Wales, golf, Real Madrid, you know? So yeah. it's... Uh, was there a lack of hunger there to do more and to go and play at a, a first team at a club? Like we talked in our chat about you leaving to get first know, team football. What's he got to prove? At 32, you look at it and you say, well, Gareth, why didn't he go and play? Why didn't you? Yeah. You, you look at situations like that and, There's you know... 600 million pounds in the bank. Would you want to go and play football for a living? Uh, but there's two sides to every story. You know, Gareth Bale obviously will have a great with Real Madrid. I remember there were stories of him maybe leaving and they wouldn't let him leave, and obviously Real Madrid didn't like him. And it just started off with something small and then festered and festered and festered, and Gareth dug his heels in, so did the club, and that's why you end up with a situation like that. But Gareth proved everything that he needs to prove in the game. He's going to go out there and have a great World Cup, I'm pretty sure of that. I think Wales will get out of that group, um, and then depending on who they get in the last 16, I think Wales will have a good World Cup. The USA are good. But I, I, I think Wales are more solid. I think Wales will get a result against them. And I think, you know, that's where it'll go. I think you should just count yourself lucky you didn't discover golf until you retired from football or it would have been over a hell of a lot sooner as well. <laughs> what about England then? Harry Maguire, he's going to start. He'll have Dyer and Stones alongside him. There'll be presumably Bellingham and Declan Rice. There'll probably be Trippier, Shaw, and then a pretty impressive front three, whatever way Southgate picks it. It's amazing, even just looking at the English press, the extent to which the negativity of Southgate is now all that they're talking about, that he's not going to let them off the leash, not going to score enough goals. Uh, Southgate's on the record as saying tournament football is about not conceding. How do you see England? Well, England have got a um, generational type talent. When you look at the attacking players they have in their squad, they really have everything you, you'd look for. And it just feels like Gareth Southgate isn't getting the most out of it. You know, England for years kind of were good but they weren't world class but I think England now have some really really top 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 class and they can win a World Cup but Gareth Southgate has chosen to go the pragmatic route um, and I know there was a lot of um, people complaining about leaving Tomori you know really really informed young players Mark Way here Crystal Palace these top top defenders they'll have their turn but Gareth Southgate has chosen for Harry Maguire because he's going to do what he does in tournament football and that is play a flat back five play two defensive midfield players and three attackers 
uh, and hopefully Harry Kane, they've got one of the best goal scorers in world football, he'll get them a goal and they'll win 1-0. Now they'll breeze through their group, they'll, they'll, they'll thump Iran, they'll, they'll probably have a good old toss with Wales and they'll probably thump America as well. So they'll, they'll, they'll come out of their group handy. I'm not sure you can win a tournament. Now your argument to that is they got to a final uh, and they made it to a, a, a World Cup um, semi-final in Russia. But the side of the draw they were on dictated that. You know, they never played anyone of note, but they weren't convincing. And similarly in the Euros as well, they weren't too convincing. They came up against Italy and they got their nose in front and they just couldn't win the game. I just think that the reason England fans are unhappy is that the talent that they feel they have, the attacking talent, isn't being utilised. And England feel they should be able to take tournaments by the scruff of the neck and go and win them that way, as opposed to doing it in this pragmatic type of way. Either which way, it's going to be Southgate's last tournament. He's going to go... Um, and the new manager come in, it's going to pick people like Tomori. He's got a contract to the next he'll go. The, he'll, he, unless he Unless he, again, gets to a final or something like that. But I just think that England did well in the last two tournaments because everybody was on board with it. The media, there was a good... No, it's the same old, you know, there seems to be a divide. And whenever there's a divide with England, they never seem to do well. And what about the argument that, given the paucity of talent he has in central defence, that playing five at the back and protecting that back five or back three, is, is that not the right thing to do for Southgate? The right thing to do would have been get Tamori and all, all these players in two years out okay. and build around them, but he didn't. He went with the, he had a little dabble at it and opening it up a little bit and it didn't go well for them. They, you know, they lost to Hungary and, and teams like that and they didn't look as solid as what they did. And like anybody else, then they just revert back to type. And that's why he's picked Harry Maguire because he's got a style of play that he wants to play and Harry Maguire fits that. And Harry Maguire is very, very efficient in that flat back five. But I just think that for England to utilise the attacking players more, you need to get them on the pitch, which means you need to have less defenders. And if there's less defenders, you're going to be more susceptible to conceding goals. And that's one thing that Southgate isn't going to, um, to tolerate. In fairness to Southgate, John, Tyrone Mings, just going back to the Euros a year ago, Tyrone Mings is completely off the scene and Harry Maguire has just had such a terrible time. So he hasn't been dealt a great hand, Southgate, in that regard either. No, but he's a fan of... Um He's a fine Maguire. He's done what he's done it for England. I know he didn't do it in the Nations League, but he was quite poor. Um, but in major tournaments, you look at it. I think if England keep the back door shut, they got let take the shackles off, and the Fordens and the Grealishes and the Canes. They're incredible. So they got to let them go. You got to let them go and express themselves and uh, and play in a real, a real attacking sort of way. Uh, get on the halfway line, play in the opposition half. I'm not still not sure defensively whether England are good enough. I think that's their weak link. That's why I'm saying if they keep clean sheets and they keep that back door shut, they've got players that can win games of football, you know, in, in what they've got. You look at Sterling, you know, or Bellingham is somebody that can go forward and create something. Declan Rice is, is, is a hundred million pound player, you know. So in my opinion, if England want to go places and they want to, they want to impress, then they've got to take the handbrake off and go at teams because they've got and, players and, to do that. And, and in Bellingham, they got one of the best players, up and coming players. But you'd wonder will he get in the team? Will he play Rice and Phillips as the two number sixes, and yeah. then you've only three attackers? Whereas if you could fit in one number six, you could get Bellingham in the team. You could get Bellingham and Mount as your two eights. And then you could have three attackers if yeah. you went with a flat back four. You could fit players in with a four three three, but you'll go with a flat back five, which limits you to three attackers. And unfortunately, you know, he'll probably play Bakary Saka left wing back. He'll end up being a left full back, full back, and he won't you won't see Saka's uh, attacking yeah. threat. You won't see him. That's what we saw in the last number of games. He was back as a, a full back defending, and, and that's not what England want to see, you know. But, he'll, 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 you know, Trent Alexander-Ireland won't play well for England because he's just asked to sit in and defend. Trent's not about defending. He wants other people to do that, and he wants to get on an attack. Yeah. Forgot about Saka. Look at what he's doing at Arsenal. You know, he's magnificent. Yeah. So they've got the players. You know, they've got players to really hurt the opposition. They've got a bit of everything. They've got guile. They've got pace. They've got a great centre-forward who can score all types of goals. Gary, uh, uh, Harry Kane won't let you down. He won't let you down. You give, give him a chance. And uh, as I said, I, I think if you just let them go, you know, in all fairness, they, they lost in the Euros penalties, you know, uh, to, uh, to Italy in the final. Okay. And then obviously they're losing the semi-final 
to the, in the previous World Cup. So they've come pretty close. And I just think you've just got to let them play. It's just go and do what you do for your clubs. Go and do it for the national team. And obviously, the weak link is defensively, really, because there'd be some, they're up against some unbelievable players in the World Cup. You're up against the best of the best, the Vinicius Juniors of this world, you know, the Neymars of this world, you know, these, these players are unbelievable. It has been uh, such a feature of this World Cup and the build-up that nobody feels good about it, which is such a pity for a World Cup because we all grew up loving World Cups and probably falling in love with football at World Cups in many ways. Is there a World Cup, like a tournament where you were at a certain age or a memory that you can remember or that got you really hooked on the game in some respects? Italian 90 for me, you know, yeah. I was, I was nine years of age, very, very impressionable. And um, I remember being on a, a family holiday in a caravan in Garrettstown, which is about 20 minutes outside of Cork. <laughs> <laughs> that was the family holiday. And um, watching the, 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 the Romania game and then obviously the, the Italy game after that. Yeah. And like, I don't think we'll ever see anything like that ever again. We're a nation. No. It was just, I mean, even if, 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 if our national team got to a World Cup now, which we did in 2002, obviously, it wouldn't be the same. No. I mean, literally, it, it, all hell broke loose and nobody cared. And it was like the last days of Rome. It was just unbelievable. And that will always leave an indelible mark on me as a kid growing up in that. It was just, like, defining. Yeah. That's a hard one to beat, really. Even USA 94 wasn't what it was for you. Not think. Italian. Italian 90 is the ultimate. And even now when you watch the documentaries, there was one on recently, like yeah. about a behind the scenes thing. And it just brought back so many memories. And you, you sit there and you feel yourself welling up a little bit because they're days that you'll never get again, ever. <laughs> That's just you getting old and whimsical. John, what about you? Is there a I World like, Cup for you? Yeah, I love the 86 World Cup. Argentina, Maradona in that tournament. I just think he opened himself up to the world, you know. Um, we knew about him going into the, I was 11 years of age. Um, and I can just remember the Belgium goal, where I can't believe he never fell over. I think it was his second goal against Belgium. Obviously the goal against England as well, um, which was voted the greatest ever goal uh, in the World Cup. And of course in the final, when they went 2-0 up, uh, Carlisle Zubanega scored two goals for Germany, pulled it back to 2-2 two -two. and then Maradona's Papuru Shaga threw for the winning goal great bit of skill and Argentina won it 3-2 in the final at the Azteca Stadium in Mexico so that was one of my and I love Maradona, I think he's the greatest player ever lived, I don't think anybody gets near him um, so just watching him in that tournament was, was just incredible you know does that, does it, will anyone ever forget the name Tomofti? You know, <laughs> like it's just, it's just in my, you know, I'll never forget it. Like he's, I, I thought that when he said Maradona won the greatest, just remembering the names of that, that, that team and yeah. uh, Scalacci and, and stuff like that, their names that I will, I still Google his name every now and again to see what he's up, to. up to, Scalacci and <laughs> these lads, you know. I think Tomofti's running a pub somewhere. Someone caught up yeah, with him in yeah. the interview. I, I check up on him every now and again because it was such a big part of, 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 of my, yeah. Upbringing. Do you know what's interesting, John? When you talk about Maradona, I guess there's no mystery anymore. We're seeing all the top players week in, week out. There must have been something very exotic about knowing about Maradona and then actually seeing him for real at a World Cup on a World Cup stage. It's quite different now when we see them all week in, week out. What's that? Sorry, I didn't get that joke. <laughs> what was it? I was just saying it's, it's so different when you saw Maradona in 86. All the big players now, everyone sees them week in, week out, but you wouldn't have been seeing Maradona all that often on your television outside of the World Cup. Absolutely not. Um, I remember doing a game a few years ago in Napoli, and it stinks of Maradona. What he did there for that club, uh, you know, that, that song, Life is Life, you know, you see the, the famous warm-up, and the song is playing in the, in the background. That, they still play that before games now in yeah. Napoli yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, they're flying at the minute and I think Arsenal, Arsenal knocked them out I think it was the Europa League the year they got beat to Chelsea in in, uh, in Azerbaijan the final was in Azerbaijan two London teams travelled to Azerbaijan for the Euro Europa League final and um, you just get a taste of it Maradona murals everywhere it's, yeah. it's, just, it's just frightening 
Shame he's gone. So young. Yeah. So young. So this tournament, France are the holders. They're minus Pogba, they're minus Kante. Brazil are coming in, uh, a lot of people's favourites. Messi and Argentina, there's a sense of destiny. They're 35 games unbeaten as well, Argentina. 36, they won uh, yesterday as well. You're right, yeah. 36. Uh, Portugal and Ronaldo, it's his last chance. He's got a few things going on, but he's, uh, he's there. Uh, Germany have been written off by everyone, and then there's whoever else you want to mention. There's a sense it's a pretty open World Cup. Yeah, I think so. Um, Brazil are the favourites. You'd worry about them at centre-back, though. Uh, Thiago Silva looks like he's going to play, and then you've got Marquinhos alongside him, and Militao. Good defenders, don't get me wrong. No, I know that, 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 that Brazil team won it in 2 with uh, uh, Roque Junior, and they've never been blessed with, with, with world-class centre-backs, so maybe that, that point doesn't hold up, but you just think that tournament football, can Thiago Silva, who's played the most minutes of anyone for Chelsea this year, can he get through it alongside Marquinhos or Milito? That'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. Um, I think Argent it's Argentina's, I won't say to lose, but I think they're the favourites going into it. Yeah, I do. I think, I think they're, they're just packed in every area. I think Messi's been playing the long game for the last couple of years. Uh, took, took, took 12 months off to prepare for this when he was at PSG um, and is just coming into form at the right time. Um, he really looks like the old Messi the last six months, especially at Champions League level in the, in the France League as well. So um, he looks like the, that he's had his eye on this. This is his crowning moment. This is his last chance. He looks motivated. Uh, Martin is at centre-back. You look at their squad. They've got world-class players all through it. Um, and I think that if they can... And they look like a team as well. You know, I've watched some documentaries, behind-the-scenes things. They look like a team. Really, they do. Um, and... and and, and I suppose if I was to pick a dark horse and the dark horse they might not be but Portugal you know I know they might not be favourites but I think they'll go close I just have a funny feeling with them they've got a nice blend of pragmatic defensive football sprinkled with some world class talent and a guy that can score goals in Ronaldo so um, those three really but if you were to push me for one I'd have to say Argentina Wow I love that your team this World Cup as Ronaldo versus Messi That's, uh... They could meet in the final isn't that right if the two of them uh, It'll depend who finishes where in each group Yeah Potentially. I mean, that'd be something. Uh, would you like to see Messi do it, John? Yeah, from a sentimental point of view. Um, he's, been, he's been brilliant, unbelievable. He's just a genius with the ball at his feet. Um, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think Argentina, Brazil meet in the semi-final. Um, I think I heard that a couple of days ago. Somebody said throughout the tournament, so I don't think you get the final that maybe everybody want once you know so Brazil I think I've got an unbelievable squad Damien doesn't quite think defensively strong maybe um, but how much defending do you really do when, when you're Brazil in terms of going forward and you rely on your front players to go and get you the goals and win your games you know it's like playing it's like playing at Barcelona really you know there's only two or three teams in Spain that can in their pomp that could test them defensively. Atletico, Barca, sorry, um, Real Madrid. It's like when you're playing for Celtic. My, my father could play centre-half for Celtic at times. It's easy to sweep up. You know, they don't get an awful lot of pressure against them. Um, so when you talk about Brazil, Brazil have always, have always been a forward-thinking team. They want to outscore the opposition. If they concede three, they want to score four. Whether that's going to change in the World Cup, I don't know. But um, I can't see past Brazil. Right. They are squad. We were just looking at it back there. You know, Martinelli, I could go on, you know, Vinicius Junior. A frightening squad. Um, so, for me, I, I, I can't see past Brazil. I think they're favourites for, rightly so. Yeah. It's interesting there with Brazil, for the last couple of tournaments, it's all been about Neymar. And now the supporting cast yeah, yeah, almost overshadow Neymar a touch. Yeah, got good players around him, yeah. Take a bit of pressure off him. Yeah. And maybe then that's when he'll produce. Do you think this is going to be a good World Cup in that the point has been made, the players will be fresher, in that it's happening now as opposed to at the end of a long league and European season? Do you buy into that? Yeah, I do. And, I, I, and also the long run in... To a, to a World Cup, you know, sometimes you could have three weeks yeah. before, and I think mean, that's the killer. Once the tournament starts, it's fine because it's on. 
and then everyone can gather around, watch games, and you're playing your own game, and you're coming back, and you know, it's very exciting. It's the long three week, sometimes three and a half week away in some retreat somewhere, and some teams make rules of no family, some teams make rules of you can't have a family. That can be a tough shift, and a lot of players mentally are just drained, fatigued, tired, fed up, and by the time they get to it, they're not ready. I think it'll be a good thing that players are 16, 17, 18 games into a league season, depending on where you are in Europe. Um, they only met up on, on Monday, and they're playing the first game on Monday. So it's just like a normal thing, and we're going to whiz through it. And once the football starts, four games a day, everybody will just get into it. And, and I'm genuinely really looking forward to it. As a spectacle, I think it's going to be, it's going to be pretty good. Um, so many things can happen. So many teams have chances. Um, but once the football starts, I think it's going to be great. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's going to be surreal as well, the final, a couple of days uh, before Christmas. I, I, like, th again, there is so much wrong with Qatar and uh, the debts and the social issues. Uh, but as for tournaments in December or World Cups in December, it probably will happen every four or five tournaments now into the future. World Cups will go to that part of the world. Yeah. I guess we'll, we'll come to, in their own uh, unique way, enjoy those December World Cups and bit of sunshine in the winter yeah, well, kind of vibe. From, from, from the football point of view, I think there's eight state-of-the-art stadiums. I think three of them have been brought in, in trucks, built, be taken down, taken away, once yeah. the tournament is over. It's amazing how they do these things. Yeah. And every seat in every stadium will have air conditioning under the seat. Every single seat, 80,000, whatever. So in terms of trying, spending ridiculous amounts of money on it, trying to make it one of the best World Cups ever. Now, I know there's negativity, there's negativity surrounding lots of issues, but yeah. a lot of other World Cups that we've been to, there's been negativity as well. Yeah. Um, so, from my own point of view, um, I would just, I'm there to commentate on football, really. Um, and ITV, I think, have made a statement on, on other issues and things like yeah. that. So and are you I, hope, I hope we're talking about the football and not, you know, not other things. Well, look, there's room for both. I don't think Qatar should be led away with what they've done either here. Um, so there's room for both. And if, if people feel comfortable talking about their misgivings, they should. And if they don't, they shouldn't feel pressurized as players to do it. Like I saw James Madison, he gave a press conference yesterday and he said, look, at, you know, I'm, I'm all for diversity and I'm, I'm progressive, but at a certain point, I don't feel well informed enough to say much more beyond that. I don't know if say the wrong thing, yeah. and that's where I am. And I think there should be an understanding for players to say that kind of a thing as well, you know? So we'll have to see how it plays out. I mean, um, there's, there's uh, different opinions as to whether there'll be a strong enforcement of rules and regulations or if there'll be a degree of loosening the handbrake and let people enjoy themselves as they usually do at a World Cup. So we, we don't quite know how it's all going to play out. I guess we'll, we'll see that in due course. So to begin to wrap things up, you were saying you think Argentina, and you reckon Brazil. Brazil, yeah, for me. OK. Well, we'll stick with that. Um, fellas, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Damien Delaney, great to have you with us. Thanks, Appreciate John. it. John Hartson, great to have you with us thank this you. evening thank as well. You. Thanks very much.